We don't come to the present moment with a clean slate. We have our intentions. We have our wants and desires. And it's not wise to try to deny them. If you deny them, they go underground. When they go underground, you can't see them. That means they'll have an influence on your life that you don't understand. What you want to do is bring them out into the open. Look at your intentions. Look at your understandings of things. Look at your desires. And try to get a sense of where they're skillful and where they're not. In other words, instead of thinking that there's a blank slate or just a state of bare awareness or bare attention you can bring to the present, realize that your attention is shaped by your intentions, and your intentions are shaped by your understandings. And then look for them. This is one of the reasons why we meditate. We're given a good intention. We're given a good understanding. And then we try to apply it to see what other intentions come up, what other understandings come up. It's like putting a dam across a river. If you don't dam the river, or try to build a dam across the river, you never know how strong the current at the bottom of the river is. You put an obstacle in its path and it'll start coming up to the surface, and you see all oh, these things that were underground are very strong. And then when you see them, you can do something about them. So as you're meditating here and you're noticing the mind slipping off to other things, the first step is just not to follow it. Make it a rule in your mind that wherever the mind goes in the course of the hour, you're going to bring it back here to the breath. As for the other currents in the mind, you just let them be. A story will come up, and there's no need to finish the story. A question will come up, and there's no need to answer it. Just come back to the breath, back to the breath. Once you get better at this, then you can start looking at those questions, looking at those stories, to see what they show you about underlying impulses, desires, intentions, ways you understand things. Because sometimes you'll have to argue with them in order to pull the mind back. they say, but you've got to think about this. This is important. Or learn to question that. Why is it important? The more you're able to question these things, the more you understand them. And you may get to the point where you realize you don't really believe them. You don't really agree with them. You let these things that you don't agree with shape your life. But now that you see them in action and you've got an alternative, you can shape your life in another direction. In other words, you're reconditioning yourself. The Buddha said the path is one of abandoning and developing. It's not that we're getting back to our true nature. If it, was, if it, if it were our true nature, you wouldn't have to develop it. It would just be there. You'd clear away all these bad conditionings you had from the past, and bingo, there you are, awakening. But that's not the way it goes. You've got to develop good qualities to replace the ones you want to let go. The Buddha never assumed that we're basically good. He never assumed that we're basically bad. The only thing he assumes when he teaches people is that they desire happiness. And for the most part, we don't understand that desire. We don't know how to act on it in a wise way. So what he's giving us is wise strategies, wise tactics. 
that will lead to a happiness that's solid, lasting, sure, something we can trust. Because otherwise, given the fact that the mind can go both for skillful and unskillful things, means that you can't really trust it. It's scary to think about, but it's good to know so that you can prepare about it, prepare for it. Just look at the issues of the body. As long as the body is well fed, we tend to be good citizens, be friendly, amiable. Wouldn't think of stealing anything from anybody. But suppose you're really, really hungry, and you've got a family to feed. What would you do in a case like that? You've got this body that eats food, and it's not the case that once you've eaten that piece of food, you can give it to somebody else and let them eat it, too. They wouldn't want it. You would either, well, no matter how it works, if you spit it out to give it to them, they wouldn't want it. If you waited till it went through your system, they certainly wouldn't want it. So it's an either-or situation. As long as there's plenty of food, there's no problem. Look at the hummingbirds. And there's lots and lots of nectar for everybody. There's not too much squabbling, but when the bottles run out of nectar, they get unglued. And they attack each other even more than normal. That's what human beings are, too. got this body that we're attached to, and this is why we took birth in this body. We identify with it. It's us. It's ours. It's a really deep identification that precedes almost all the other identifications you can think of. It's one of the reasons why that chant that we, do, that we did just now is one that people complain about most. Nobody likes the chant, and how this body is full of unclean things. The purpose of the chant is to call that attachment into question. Do you really want to be attached to this bundle of needs? This point is related to that other chant we do every night on the four requisites to remind ourselves of why we have food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. It's because we've got this body that needs these things. You can you imagine where we'd be tonight without the shelter of this cellar? or any place for shelter, cold wind blowing off the ocean, coming down from Alaska. If we didn't have any clothing, if we didn't have any food, didn't have any medicine to care for the illnesses that would be sure to come, we'd be in miserable straits, all because of this body, because it needs these things. We also chant those chants to remind ourselves of how much is enough, you know, enough to cover the body to keep it warm, and when it's cold to keep it sheltered from the sun when it's hot, enough food to keep the body going so you can practice, enough shelter to protect you from the elements, medicine for the diseases you actually have or could have easily. If you learn to have enough of these things, in other words, if you have a strong sense of enough, it makes it easier to get along with other people. But even then, there comes a time when there's not enough. And can you trust yourself not to behave in unseemly ways? Your ability to trust yourself in that way means that you really have to let go of this attachment to the body. You have to learn how not to identify with it. So the chant on the 32 parts is a very useful tool for learning to trust yourself, teaching you to get some distance from the body and its needs. This is why we train the mind. So we're going to have inner resources to draw on when external resources get get slim, run low. This is where training in attention and intention is so important, realizing that true happiness does not have to depend on the body. 
depends on the mind's understanding what it's doing and learning to notice when it acts in a skillful way, when it acts in an unskillful way. When you can bring that kind of attention and intention to any moment, whether it's where you're, when you're by yourself, when you're with other people, look for your intention and then look for your understanding of what's going on. And ask yourself, is this in line with the Buddha's understanding? that suffering comes from our own ignorance and craving, and not from what other people do or what happens to the body. And if you find that your understanding of things deviates from that, then you've got to question it. This is why when the Buddha gave instructions to his son, when the son was seven years old and just getting started in the practice, he said to focus on your intentions before you do anything, before you say anything, before you think anything. Ask yourself, why am I doing this? What is this going to lead to? He didn't say just bring an open mind to every situation. He said realize you're bringing an intention to this situation. So learn by watching your intentions and then seeing what actually happens when you follow through with them. So you learn from experience which kinds of intentions are harmful and which ones are not. If you find yourself making a mistake, in other words, something didn't seem to be harmful, but when you actually follow through with it, it did cause harm. And then talk it over with someone else who's also practicing. And then make up your mind you're not going to repeat that mistake. It's a learning process we're involved in here. Learning what it is that we're bringing to the present moment that's shaping it, and what we're doing in ignorance that's causing suffering, what we're bringing in ignorance that turns the present moment into a moment of suffering. This is where you get clearer and clearer on what you're bringing and learn how to develop good habits, good ways of understanding things, good intentions. You find you can trust yourself more and more. Ultimately, the point you want to get to is where the mind doesn't even need those. It finds something that is unconditioned. That's the point where you can really trust yourself. Up to that point, the good things you develop could slip away. You get tired, you get lazy, you get forgetful. And the progress you made just slides back down the mountain. Like those mountains of little bits of lava gravel. They say you, as you walk up the mountain, you, you tend to be sliding down it too. And if you try to stand still, you slide down. So you've got to keep walking, 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 even just to stand at the same level. There's a fair amount of the practice, it seems like that. But realize it's not always going to be that way. There will come a point when the practice opens up to something unconditioned. And the nature of that unconditioned, it's not good, it's not bad, it's just there. But it puts you in a much better position where you're not so totally dependent on the body for your identity. Even your first taste of the deathless, there will still be a sort of a hovering sense of identity, but it's not so firmly latched on the body. So when things happen to the body, you don't have to get all worked up about it. You don't have to start doing things that you know are shameful or harmful. It's this way you begin to trust yourself. And the people around you can begin to trust you too.
So try to be very clear on what you're bringing to the present moment. And a good way of doing that is, as I said, practice meditating and get a very specific intention in your mind as you meditate. You're going to stay with the breath. And then try to develop the quality of breathing that allows you to stay for long periods of time. Notice what other intentions come up in the mind that try to divert you. And learn how to sidestep them, how to get around them, so they don't have power over the mind. And then take the same sensitivity in whatever you do, when you're conversing with other people, when you're working outside. Always try to be clear about your intention. If you don't have a clear intention, try to establish one. Say you're talking with somebody, what would be a good intention to have for this conversation? Keep that intention in mind and then see where the conversation goes. Whatever you do, always try to have, be very clear about your intention. Try to give rise to a skillful intention. And see what that stirs up in the mind. Sometimes you'll find some other alternative intentions that were hiding out under the surface. It's good to know that they're there, even though they complicate things. At least you know they're there. You can deal with them. Other times you won't find anything like that. The good intention will come easily. And the clearer it is, the more powerful it will be. It's in this way that your training of the mind develops in all areas. It becomes a training of the total mind.